the past year, and uh, I'll bring you up to date to what, what I mean by that. If you just look at 1 Kings chapter 12, it says in verse 1, it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, and all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass, when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Let's just stop right there, and let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be gathered. And, uh, and Father, we have a lot of things that go on in life, and it can be a busy week, and life is always busy. But Father, we pray that uh, you'd calm us down today, and that you would direct our minds and our hearts toward your word and some things that are important to you. And that we would give you our attention, and that we would give you our faith. And we would believe the things that you have revealed in your word, and trust your word trust your son, and if there's any here that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, be saved today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now we've been studying salvation. Uh, that we've been looking at going through the Bible and, and studying salvation. We've seen from the very beginning that salvation came as man sinned and God brought forth a promise that he was going to bring salvation for sinners from the penalty of their sins. And then we started to see how that plan, that God's promise of salvation is unfolded and progressively through the scriptures. Uh, and, and, and till we've already looked ahead to realize that the full understanding of our salvation finally came to and was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. But the promise of salvation is not something new to Paul. The promise of salvation goes to, all the way back to the beginning of time, and it's unfolded in the pages of Scripture and finally revealed by the Apostle Paul that is the full cross work of Christ and how God brought about his promise of salvation to save sinners from the penalty of their sins so that sinners can be forgiven and stand before God and, and have eternal fellowship with God and for us in heaven. So uh, we, we, that's the theme that we're studying. But there's another parallel study that we could have made all the way through here. Uh, every once in a while we infer it just a little bit, but today we're just going to kind of open it up and, and look right at it. And that is, you could actually not only go through your Bible and see the unfolding plan of God, uh, uh, unfolding provision of God's salvation, but you could actually study your Bible and see how there's an opposing plan of Satan against everything that God is revealing and doing throughout the Bible and that Satan is always opposing what God is doing. There's an opposition there. There's a satanic policy of evil. In fact, there's a, uh, a book that we have in, in, our, in a bookstore out there that is called Satan's Plan of Evil. And, and the reason it's called that, the author began to do what we're doing. We're, we're studying salvation. But he, and, and sometimes, you know, what we're actually doing too is since it's progressive and it's unfolding, we're seeing dispensational Bible study, the unfolding of God's plan and purpose. But he did the same thing, only rather than looking at God's plan unfolding, he studied Satan's plan unfolding because every time God does something, Satan comes up with a counterfeit, an opposition to what God is doing. Now we come to a place that we can't ignore that. We come to a place that where it's so exposed in the scripture that we need to take the time to not to advance our study of salvation, but to realize Satan's opposition to it in the in the connection to where we are historically in Israel's program. And and but because it's so clear to see, there's going to be a warning to all of us of all ages, but we'll, we'll get it out of the scriptures here that are written for our instruction, for our learning, some things that we can learn here concerning how Satan works, how, what God thinks of that, and our separation from it, our responsibility to be separated from it. And when, and when I prayed that you, your heart would be focused in on, 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 on the concern of this, to, be, to ignore, when Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we're not ignorant of his, Satan's devices. It's dangerous not to know your enemy. It's dangerous not to realize, as it tells us in Ephesians 6, that we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a battle going on. For you to ignore that, for you not to go through life and realize that, 
is for you then to not be forewarned from Scripture and not prepared to do battle when it's time to do battle. And, and so it's important for you to see that. And uh, so, but, but at the same time, in this passage, it's very important for you to see what God thinks of, Saint, of Satan's policy of evil. What's God's attitude toward it? Because when the Bible says, your ways are not my ways, saith the Lord, you'd probably cooperate with Satan's plan of evil. Or if you didn't cooperate, you would say, well, it's not really all that bad. But you need to realize what God thinks about it so that the third thing will happen is you'll realize your responsibility to stay away from it, to separate from it. Now, Satan has been operating from the very beginning. When man sinned, Satan opposed God's creation of man and God given man dominion and man to rule this world under God's authority as the creator. Satan opposed that by deceiving man and making man obey him rather than God. And, and all the way through as we study the Bible, we could go back and point out what Satan was doing. Here we are where we got Israel who was going to be God's channel of blessing, God's channel of salvation to the earth. And all of a sudden we come to the nation of Israel in its greatest historical position where Solomon is reigning, there's rest from all the enemies, so then he builds the city, he builds himself a, a, the temple, he builds the palace that he dwells in, and all the earth is seeking to Solomon for his wisdom, but our last study showed us how Solomon fell. In fact, we're going to see that, the, that Solomon planted the seed of the nation's demise. Ahijah the prophet rose up and foretold the consequence, and now history is going to record the un the fulfillment of that. And uh, if you don't remember that Solomon, he introduced idolatry to the nation of Israel as he married women of the Gentiles and brought them to Israel and then eventually built them their own temples. And Ahijah was raised up and said that God's going to rent the kingdom from you, but not in your day, but in your son's day. Now as you open up in 1 Kings chapter 12, when it mentions in verse 1 there, and Rehoboam went to Shechem, Shechem there, and then all Israel went to Shechem there and made him king. Jeroboam is is the son of Solomon. The last verses in chapter 11, Solomon died. And Rehoboam is going to take his place. And so he amounts to, he, uh, amounts to the throne there. And then in verses 2 and 3, it talks about Jeroboam. Well, Jeroboam's that one that Ahijah the prophet took and rent his clothes into ten pieces and told him, ten of the tribes of Israel, God's going to put into your hands. Well, Solomon ain't going to put up with that, so <laughs> he takes off out of town. Solomon was going to kill him try to stop it from happening, but he goes to Egypt, and now Solomon's dead, and Israel asks Jeroboam, you come and represent us, we need to go ask the king a question. And, uh, and so they, they, the Jeroboam comes back from Egypt, and they go before Je uh, Rehoboam. Now, you know me and my names? <laughs> you follow along real close. <laughs> What's going to be interesting is not only Jeroboam, uh, no, no, wait, no, I was going to get ahead of myself, and probably I shouldn't do it. I, I won't do it, because it would just make more things. But there's Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Jeroboam is going to be uh, a lead, take leadership over the ten northern tribes. Watch verse 4. It says, now, now, they, they, now the, Jeroboam with the nation of Israel has come before Rehoboam, and they said in verse 4, the father, your father, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, thou, uh, make thou the grievous service of thy father, and the heavy yoke which he put upon us, lighter that we may serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart ye yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. See, when Solomon did all this fabulous stuff to the city, to the palaces, to the, to, uh, uh, the temple, I mean, the way he did that is he taxed the people and, uh, and even taxed Gentile nations that he had authority over. So the people under Solomon, they've been taxed pretty heavy, but everything that he set out the tax to do was accomplished. And, uh, you, know, you know, the old saying that, you know, the only thing that lasts forever is a temporary tax. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they're going to do a temporary tax, you know, pay for the Mackinac Bridge, but it never ends. And then, uh, you know, they build a the turnpike or something, and they're going to tax until the turnpike is paid, and then that never ends. And so anyhow, the, the people here are saying, hey, look, you know, your father put a lot of grievous burden on us, and now lighten it up and we'll serve you. 
And so Rehoboam, he's got the first decision as he's taken the throne, what to do. And so he sends them away, and then he's going to turn to his advisors. In verse 6 it says, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father, while he yet, while he, uh, yet lived, lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. Now, you know, sometimes you look at that and you realize the aged men, they have some wisdom. And, uh, and for him to just dismiss immediately the old men's wisdom is dangerous. Young people, you need to learn from the older people the wisdom that they've learned in life. Now that doesn't always mean that the wisdom is right. I've gone through some things in the ministry where I've seen, they used to call us the younger men, and uh, the older men decided the King James Bible wasn't right, and didn't want the younger men who's believed the King James Bible is always right to fellowship with them anymore. So older men aren't always right in their decisions. But you know, you do give them the benefit of listening why what they're saying, and the conclusion, if you listen to what they're saying, is that you have to listen to them to correct the Bible rather than just believe the Bible, and I wasn't going that way. So uh, I just decided I'm going to believe the Bible and, and not go along with them. But I would have continued to fellowship had they not decided, no, you shouldn't fellowship with us, and, and so that particular conference I no longer go to. Uh, I, I say that to you because sometimes you don't always follow the counsel of older men. But you do at least take the, the courtesy uh, of listening. Now, in, in Rehoboam's case, this is Solomon's, his dad, advisor. Solomon's the wisest man that ever lived. How, do, how can you be an advisor to Solomon? You've got to be top-notch. For him to dismiss their wisdom is to dismiss uh, uh, some good advice. And, and you see that he's going to dismiss that for the younger men's counsel. Younger men who have never been tested. Younger men who have never learned leadership. Younger men who have never suffered burden. Because certainly the advisors in the government, they're not under the grievous burden, are they? The, the people who are on the governmental staff, they're not suffering the same consequence the people are. And we know that in our own government, don't we? They don't even have the same health care system <laughs> or the social security system that we have. They have their own because they don't trust Social Security, but they put us under it. But anyhow, that, I'm not going to get into politics there. <laughs> Verse 9, it says here, it says, And he said unto them, What counsel, now he's talking to the young men, give ye that we may, uh, that we may answer this people uh, who have spoken to me, saying, Make this yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto, the pe unto this people, and speak unto, uh, that speak unto thee, saying, Thy father made your yokes heavy, but, y but, but make thou it lighter to us. Thus shalt thou say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now, and now whereas my father did lay upon you heavy yoke, a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scorpions. So Solomon, uh, so, no, so Jeroboam, well, we'll get back to that. Anyhow, you get the idea there that, that he is uh, going to, rather than lighten their taxes, he's going to make it worse. And as a result of that, Israel had to make a decision. It says in verse uh, 12, So Jeroboam and all the, people, uh, uh, all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come again to me the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the, the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, I will add to your yoke. My father also chastened you with, with whips, uh, I will chasten you with scorpions. Therefore, wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of the Lord, that he might perform the saying which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shalemite uh, uh, unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Now what God already predicted is I'm going to rent the kingdom and so by him taking the advice of the council the kingdom is going to get rent because as a result of hearing this decision Israel made a choice. Their response was 
a revolution, a rebellion. Verse 16 it says, and, so, and when all Israel saw that the, that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, What portion have we in David? Now see, he's the son of David. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, that's David's father, to the intent that Israel, uh, to, the, to, the, to your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. Down in verse 19, so Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So the, what, what's being called Israel is the ten northern tribes. When you look at verse 20, and it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, they sent and called him to, unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And then when you look down in verse 20, it says the tribe of Judah only, but when the, actually Jer Jeroboam's going to cause a rebellion and he... he assembles together the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. God told the prophet Ahijah that, that he would give David one, one other tribe. So David is of the tribe of Judah, and the other tribe that's going to join with Judah is Benjamin. They're going to be under the leadership of the sons of David, under Rehoboam. Then north of them are ten, what we call the ten northern tribes. Israel's broken into twelve tribes. The ten northern tribes... They, are going, they have appointed Jeroboam to be their king. And they're separating. They're, there's a rebellion. There's a revolution. And they're separating. They're not going to be unified. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he, was in, when he came to earth, and they began to say to him that you're casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. That the Lord just implied to them that, no, I'm not. He says, can a kingdom divide against itself stand? Actually, he said, a kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. And if I cast out devil by the powers of Beelzebub, and then he goes on warning them about the consequence of that kind of thinking. But, but he, he warned that a kingdom divided against itself would not stand. Israel is no longer one nation anymore. It's two different nations. It's the northern ten tribes are going to be called Israel. From this point on through the books of Kings and Chronicles, the, the southern two tribes are going to be called Judah. They're going to have separate kings, and, uh, and as a result, Jeroboam is going to become the king of the ten northern tribes. Now, that, that's, that all took place as prophesied that it would take place because of the sin of Solomon. But it was also prophesied, and we didn't look at all the details, that Rehoboam, God would bless, Jeroboam, excuse me, that God would bless him if he would follow the ways of the Lord, the laws of God. But look at chapter 12, and look at verse 25. And uh, by the way, the things that we're going to study from here on out gets to the theme of what I said we were going to study. I, I would actually entitle this Jeroboam's Sin. Watch what the verses say. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Peniel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now, sh now shall the kingdom return unto the house of David. If this people go up and do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people be turned again unto their Lord, that's a small l there, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, uh, go again to, uh, Rehoboam king of Judah. Now he's thinking some things out. Remember where they have to worship. When Israel's going to worship, there's one place for them to worship. They built a temple in a place that God had appointed where he would meet the nation of Israel. Three times a year, they have to go and present themselves before God in that temple. That temple's in Jerusalem. They're now a divided nation. Jeroboam's saying, now wait a minute here, this is fine and dandy, I'm their king. But if these people start making this pilgrimage down to Jerusalem, it won't be long that they realize the seat of David is God's choice of the throne. And what do you do with a rebellious, with a king that's dethroned the proper king? You assassinate him. You kill him. He's dead. <laughs> so he said, if these people go down to Jerusalem, they're going to turn back to Rehoboam, and, and I'm a goner. So he's realizing the consequence of that divided kingdom and what it was going to cost him. And what he starts devising in his mind is he starts looking at the situation and, and realizing that he needs to invent a counterfeit religion for political control. 
Look at verse 28. Whereupon, after he was reasoning all this in his mind, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people, for the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. Now, you know, if you haven't paid attention to your Bible at this point, you, you wouldn't understand what it means even unto Dan. There's a couple things wrong here. There's a bunch of places. Notice back in verse 25, it talks about Ephraim. That's going to be a place that, he, that Jeroboam is going to put his throne. He lives in the north and in the, in, the, in the territory of Ephraim. You know, you'd be familiar with that in the New Testament because that land eventually is going to be called Samaria and the place that he put his throne. And then there's going to be a false religious practice set up. And you might remember in John chapter 4 about a woman of Samaria saying to the Lord, you worship in Jerusalem, we worship in the mountains here. You say in Jerusalem is the place. And the Lord said to her, he said, you know not what you worship. That, that began right back here as he sets up some idolatrous worship there in, 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 in that area. But when he did, he, puts, he makes two calves of gold, he puts one... Now, they're in the northernmost tribe. Back in the book of Judges, the tribe of Dan didn't like the location they had, and they went out to find some new territory, and they ended up adopting some adulter uh, idolatrous worship when they moved and put their, their, the, the new territory in the northernmost part of Israel up in Dan. They're already got idolatry going up there. Jeroboam takes a calf and he puts it up in Dan and he says if you live in the north just go up to Dan to worship. Don't go down to Jerusalem. Go up to Dan to worship. That's what it means even unto Dan. Where would, why would you go to Dan? They're already in apostasy. Now you stick a calf up there. Then if you, gotta go, if you live somewhere in between you've got to go south he puts one right at the southern border, border before you go down in Judea he puts it in Bethel. And he, and he puts a, a, a one there, and he says, Don't, it's just too far to go all the way down to Jerusalem. You can stop here and worship. So he sets two uh, places up for them to worship, and it, and it caused, it, what's there caused the nation of Israel to sin. Now, when he sets up this adulterous worship, notice in verse 28 it says, whereupon the king took counsel. Learning a lot about counsel, aren't we? You know, you know how Satan works. And when I said you're going to learn how Satan works, is Satan, there's all kinds, like, there's tons of places in the Bible to show you this, but where Satan works is giving you counsel through someone that he's already worked in their mind and their heart about. What got the kingdom split is Rehoboam listened to the wrong counsel, didn't he? The Bible said it was of the Lord. The Lord actually worked through the false counsel to cause that, that thing to get split. So God said it was going to be split, and, and it became split. Now here Jeroboam is seeking uh, some things out of his own heart, and he seeks counsel and ends up creating a, a new religious worship. The reason I say that is there's an awful lot of talk about counsel today. Got to go to a counselor, got some problems. I mean, if you get in trouble with the courts, they send you to a counselor no matter what goes on. But, you know, counselors aren't necessarily a good thing. Because what worked in the mind and the heart of the counselor to give you counsel? What kind of counsel are they going to give you? Let me show you. We're going to come back here. Come over to Psalms chapter 1. Look how this book just begins. <laughs> Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So you've got to watch uh, where, who you're hanging around with and, and, uh, and what's occupying your time. But even before that, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. How is it that you conduct your life? Where is it that you've learned the lessons of life and the decisions that you need to make in life? Did it come from the counsel of the, of the ungodly? 
Well, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, but look at verse 2. But his, uh, so if you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you're walking under God's counsel. It says in verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And it goes on to express how he is nourished and brings forth fruit in his life, like a tree that's well watered and nourished brings forth. So in your life, you can live life based on the counsel of ungodly, or you can learn from God's word what God would counsel you to live by, and as a result of living by God's word, you would be blessed, and there'd be fruit in your life. Let, let me show you something else. It's just kind of an interesting statement as well in Psalms 107. I got a phone call this week. This didn't, I had this these things to teach already, whether I got the phone call or not, just an interesting call came in. And, and I didn't check into it enough to say negative about the person, but the call was this. I'm calling from Dr. So-and-so's office, and Dr. So-and-so like, would like to come to your church and explain to people how they can overcome stress in their life, because we live in a real tough time and people are full of stress. But she didn't say, so-and-so is a believer in Jesus Christ, and he's going to come and give you the counsel of God. They, he just wanted access to you, through me, to let him come and tell you how to deal with stress in your life. Now, he might have some good things to say. I don't know. But they didn't say he represented the Lord. And I told the lady, I said, well, thank you very much, but we come here every week for those very things, to learn how God would have us to live, and that the result of living the way God would have us to live, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, temperance. Against such there is no law. And, and I says, those are the things that we're working on putting into people's lives every week. I don't, we don't need someone to come and tell us about those things. And then she tried to explain why he can do something more than that, give you techniques. And, and maybe there are techniques, because, you know, there is some stress in life. But uh, anyhow, look, look, at, look at Psalms 107, verse 8. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works un, uh, to the children of men. Now, I didn't prepare a Thanksgiving message this week, so if you're going to get anything out of Thanksgiving, take that verse with you. Because, you know, the one thing that I always think about in Thanksgiving is a lot of people learn to be thankful, but only we know who to really give thanks to. You know, some people can give thanks to Allah. Some people are just going to give have a silence or something before they <laughs> have a meal. And uh, some are just going to thank their parents for cooking them a good turkey and, and then eat. But, uh, but we, we know who to give thanks to. And that, that expression there, it, it would be more blessed. Though all that men would praise the Lord, the true God, Jehovah God, known to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For His goodness, to know what His goodness has brought us, not for what we want or what we got, but for His goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Does your soul long for something? Is your soul hungry for something? God will fill it. You don't need a guy telling you stress relief. You don't need some techniques. You need the counsel of God in your life. You need to take the word of God and do what Job and Jeremiah did. They ate it. It was more important to them than their necessary food. And, and, and when you take in God's word, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And what we've learned, that is how to be filled with God's spirit. You need filled? Are you hungry? God will fill you. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being abound in afflicted, uh, uh, bound, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God, and condemned the counsel of the Most High. See what happens when you ignore God's word. Rather than be satisfied and filled, there's nothing but darkness and the shadow of death. There's the affliction of iron in your life. That's stress. <laughs> that's balled up and can't get out. But that's what happens when someone ignores the counsel of the Most High. You realize you've got God's Word to give you light in life's pathway. 
For you to ignore God's word and go to a counselor. Now hopefully if you go to a counselor, you go to a Christian counselor. But a lot of times you go to a Christian counselor and they went to Michigan State and they've learned from the psychology department of some university how to give you counsel and then they're, because they're a Christian they say they're going to give you Christian counsel but really what they're giving you is their things that they learned in a secular university that didn't come through a thorough knowledge of study of God's Word and realize that there is fruit of the Spirit for walking after the Spirit and anyhow so you gotta be careful about all those things but my, my point to you most of all is do you ignore the counsel of the Most High Maybe that's why you're bound in the affliction of iron. But again, as we said back here in Kings, you realize that there, there's some bad counsel being given. And the way Satan works, as you're going to see, is Satan preaches. Satan is a preacher. And that's where the counsel comes in, where Satan is going to oppose the things of God. So going back to 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam make, causes Israel to sin. And it becomes the sin of Jeroboam. It becomes a great sin in the nation of Israel. Repeated over and over again as we'll look at next week. But, but in this sin, there's some details here that just, you just, they're just so obvious. They, they're just a lesson all by themselves. Verse 28 again of chapter 12 of 1 Kings says, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. You realize that he is he, in inventing this religion, he is inventing a religion of, of uh, convenience. Too much. You, you don't want to go all the way to Jerusalem. Especially if you live way up in the north, that's a, you've got to travel 60 miles to go worship the Lord. That's, that's too much. So we'll give you a convenient place to stop and worship along the way. And so he pet sets one up in Dan and the other in Bethel. But, but he, he makes the, he, it, it's just too much for them. He, he, he gives them like a shortcut to spirituality. Uh, I, you know, when I think too much, not only is it, you know, too much to actually sit down and study the Bible and learn the truth. It really don't matter where you go. Just worship in the church of your choice. The one down the street will be fine. That's convenient, isn't it? Then when you go to the church of your choice, they're liable to give you, it's too hard to read the King James Bible. Let me give you one that's easier. And they replace the infallible Word of God with a Bible that has errors in it. That waters down the deity of Christ, that waters down the Word of God, that waters down the plan of salvation, takes right division right out of it. But it's too hard to study the King James Bible. So, a, religious of, a religion of convenience. He knows how to deal with the people. Oh, yeah, I like this. I don't have to go down to Jerusalem. It, too much for you to go down to Jerusalem. Uh, Behold thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, the other put he in Dan. And then it says in verse 30, And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places. So Solomon built a house, didn't he? The house of God, the temple of God, the place where when God wanted people to come to worship in a place, there's a place that God chose. But now he not only has these idols up there, he built houses for them there. And when he built those houses, he built those houses in high places. Now high places ought to remind you of how the Gentiles got in trouble in the first place is the Gentiles got together, turned away from God, and was going to worship the creation rather than the Creator, and they built a tower whose top might reach unto heaven. You realize what the high places are? They're putting these temples on the top of a mountain so that you can worship the stars, so that you can worship these idols down here. They represent angelic creatures that are up there. And so these high places, he's building them temples in these high places. That takes you all the way back to Babel. And then, after he builds these temples in these high places, it says, uh, verse 31 again, he made, the, made a house in high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not the sons of Levi. I mean, if you're going to have a new God and then a new temple to worship God in, you've got to have some ministers there, don't you? So, he invents his own priesthood. And you know when it says, not of the tribe of Levi, you know what that means? See, God has priests in his temple down in Jerusalem. 
And the only people allowed to be priests down in Jerusalem are Levites. But not, not up in Jeroboam's religious system. In Jeroboam, he takes people of the lowest people and makes them priests. Not of the tribe of Levi. You want to be a priest? You can be made a priest. He'll make you a priest. And he doesn't follow the order of God. Do you know any religion that has priests that are not of the tribe of Levi? Because there's a real strong warning here about God that someone would dare try to mimic and Satan's a counterfeiter. To mimic what God is doing to meet, to, to, for Israel to go and stand before the most holy God, you first put an idol, then build a false place of worship, then put a false minister over there who's not of the tribe of Levi. How dare them do that such a thing? But that, that's what's going on. When it says he, he picked them of the lowest of the people, you know, I was thinking about that. What does he mean? He took the bums and, and made them priests? But think of the spiritual integrity of the person who wants to be a priest, who knows, according to God's word, he doesn't qualify. And he's willing to be one anyhow. See, if you have any spiritual integrity, you wouldn't be a part of all this. But the people who don't have any spiritual integrity, but want to be religious, want to feel like they're walking before the Lord, and holier than everybody else, like the Pharisees did, those are, those are the people that will take him up on his offer. So he takes them from the lowest of the people. So now he's got a priesthood where he's not done yet. It says in verse 32, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month and the fifteenth day of the month. Now notice the next word. Like unto the feast that is down in Judah. And he offered, uh, offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing, even, uh, uh, sacrificing unto calves that he made, and he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So, not only does he have the priesthood, now he's got some feast days, some holy days. Some holy days that God didn't indicate in the Bible that you're supposed to worship those days. You ever hear of holy days that you can't find a verse in the Bible that calls it a holy day, but tradition calls it a holy day? Where'd it come from? Some guy devised it out of his own heart. But what's interesting here, it's like unto. See, if you know the, the feast days, one of the, the greatest feast day in the nation of Israel is the Day of Atonement. When before God, they can be forgiven of all their sins. That's in the seventh month, tenth day of the month. Day of Atonement. But he's going to create a feast day, and he's going to pick the eighth day, or the eighth month, I forget what day it was, 15th day of the month. Uh, oh, and the 15th day of the seventh month is when they go out into the tabernacles. So anyhow, he picks, he picks a month later, and it's like what's going down in Jerusalem, but he's got it going up here. Do you realize what he's doing? If that's the Day of Atonement that he's counterfeiting, he's got a counterfeit way of getting your sins forgiven through a counterfeit sacrifice and a counterfeit priesthood and a counterfeit temple. He's mimicking everything that the nation of Israel had. And there's only one way to, to approach God. It's God's way. And in that, by the way, when you read the book of Hebrews, in case we don't get far enough here, when you read the book of Hebrews, even God's way of going down to Jerusalem in the temple has been replaced by the new and living way the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross work. Even the Jewish people, even in the future, when the Antichrist tries to bring them all, all this stuff back, they're not to go back to it because Jesus Christ, his death, becomes the means which people's sins can be forgiven them and they can approach God through him and have everlasting life. But anyhow, you see him setting up this counterfeit religion. And notice at, at the end of verse 32, we've read it, I'll pick up again right in the middle of verse 32. He says, so, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves, now notice these, verses, these words, that he made, and placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he made, and offered upon the altar which he made in Bethel, and the, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month which he devised, out of, his own, devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and offered upon the altar burnt incense. See all the expression, he made, he made, he made, he devised out of his own heart. 
a religious system that has practices that you ask, where is that in the Bible? And they can say, oh, that's not in the Bible, that's our religious tradition. Well, if it's not in the Bible, then some man made it up. Now, this becomes a sin. Jeroboam, it's the sin of Jeroboam whereby he makes Israel to sin. They're going to follow his leadership. And as a result of what's going to go on here, 20 kings later, about 250 years from now, the nation of Israel, the, north, the 10 northern tribes, will not exist. God's going to bring judgment. We don't have time to read the judgment here. And then following that, about 100 years after that, that sin that they were practicing in the north finally works its way down into the southern two tribes, even into the very temple of God. And then a hundred years after the northern kingdom falls to captivity and off the land, Judah will fall and be carried off the land. It's all introduced here. This is the sin that's going to bring the downfall of the nation, introducing idolatry. Now, I want to share one thing with you, and we'll go back to this because we're not done with the things we need to look at historically as well as application-wise. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And for time's sake, get 2 Corinthians 11 and get Romans, which will be to your, to your left there, Romans chapter 16. Now you got the false system being set up there. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, now this is the Apostle Paul writing to us. And, and he's really concerned, in fact maybe I should just read you his concern in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. It says, Would to God ye bear with me a little in my folly, indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that ye may be presented as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul's gospel makes us one with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're joined to him. We're one with him. But he, he worries about something in verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Be careful. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior? I hope you do. Have you bought into a false religious system and, and have a false sense of security, I hope that you'll be aware today that if you're not believing the gospel that Paul shared, you're not saved. Now, I'll show you that in a second, but, but just for now, look over in the same chapter in verse 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end is according to their works. See, what's going on back there in Rehoboam and Jeroboam's day is going on today. Only Satan's not attacking the nation of Israel. Today Satan's attack is at what God is doing in the church, the body of Christ, and the calling out of Jew and Gentile alike to make a new creature, the body of Christ, and Satan is opposing that. And as God uses the Apostle Paul to go out and preach that message, when he says, bear with me, the Corinthians were leaving the Apostle Paul and trying to follow some other people who claimed that they were the ministers of the Lord, and maybe even saw visions of an angel of light and have a new revelation of truth. And Paul says, just as Satan beguiled Eve, I'm afraid someone's going to beguile you. And that hasn't ended. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan is still doing that today. The answer is for you to know what God revealed to Paul to you. Now watch this. Look back in, in the same chapter, chapter 11, and look at verse 4. Now here's what Paul was worried about. He says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, notice what it says, whom we have not preached, well, you don't have to worry about that. No one preaches another Jesus. They all preach the same Jesus today, don't they? Okay, hang on. Some of you know better. Or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received. Some people think they got the spirit today. Their spirit doesn't always seem to work the same in everybody. It's all kinds of weird things going on, but they think the spirit of God's working. Or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 
Paul's afraid of three areas. That someone would come along and preach another Jesus, and you'd bear with them. That he would preach another spirit, you'd go along with that. And that he'd preach another gospel, and you'll buy into it. Other than what? Well, you're holding Romans chapter 16. Look at verse 25. Paul says, Now unto him that is power to establish you according to my gospel. There's only one gospel that saves today. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, he says, You're saved and you're sealed if you keep in memory. If you, um, I didn't say keep in memory. <laughs> If you have heard the word, of the, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also ye trusted after that, in whom ye also believed, you were sealed, no, I'm reading the verse wrong, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's what I wanted to get to you. Paul's gospel is the gospel of your salvation. It's how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. How that by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That God will justify a man freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Works don't save. No religious practices. Salvation is completely through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ based on God's grace and your faith in that. That's the gospel of your salvation. If someone comes along and preaches some other way of salvation, religious works of any kind, that's another gospel. But back in Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, now notice this, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Paul preached, we're going to stop here, Paul preached Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He preached Jesus Christ based on what God is accomplishing through Christ in this dispensation of grace. How do you preach another Jesus? Some churches you go to only preach Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's Jesus under the law ministering to the nation of Israel promising to set up a kingdom here on earth. If that's the only Jesus you know, you know that's another Jesus. Because it's the same person but to know Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is to know Jesus as your Savior, not Israel's Messiah. As the head of the body, the church, not the king of Israel. Of what God is accomplishing today. So, someone could come along and get you back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I go this way because they could also get you into prophecy. And, and, and miss who, who Jesus Christ is to you, what Jesus Christ has called you unto. And to do that, they might also preach another spirit called Pentecost. Pentecost, a Jewish feast day, when the Holy Spirit worked in the nation of Israel based on the new covenant that God gave to Israel, they might try to put that on you and say, that's how the Spirit's working today, and preach to you another spirit. That's not how God's Spirit's operating in the church of the body of Christ. And then they might really lead you down the wrong road and teach you water baptism for salvation. John the Baptist, repent for the remission of sins. They might teach you that you need to endure to the end to be saved and give you all kinds of religious works that are even found in the Bible that is not the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of Gentile salvation is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that God is offering salvation through the redemption that's in Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way to be saved today is to recognize you're a sinner who cannot save yourself. No religious works will ever wash away any sin. That the only thing that can take care of your sins is the blood of Jesus Christ shed at Calvary. And through his death, burial, and now his resurrection, you can trust that and God will give you eternal life. Amen. Be careful of Satan's counterfeit. It doesn't work. God's attitude toward all that, he hates it. But he loves what his son has done and he'll save those who put their faith in his son. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for giving us these warnings that are back here in the Old Testament that look like modern day life. And Father, we pray that we'll come back together next week to learn a little bit more and be a little bit more informed about these things that are important to you and ought to be important to us. Thank you for the time spent. and We do pray that your gospel message has either been the rejoicing of each believer's heart today or something new in the heart of someone that's never trusted it before. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.